In the 14th and 15th centuries, one technical innovation changed European warfare drastically – equipping ships with heavy artillery. But contrary to popular belief, at first, not the ships of the line that would later rule the seas with imposing broadsides, but rowing ships, especially galleys, were the most important element of naval warfare. For almost two centuries, the galley, with cannons on the bow, gave ships and fortresses the shivers and conquered not only the Mediterranean, but also the North and Baltic seas, and the nearby Atlantic Ocean. In this video, we investigate how the galley equipped with artillery dominated naval warfare in Europe. Barely anything changed the nature of fighting on the water as much as the introduction of artillery on ships. Of course, other technical, institutional and tactical changes had influence too, but artillery was a game changer. The use of firearms was nothing new in itself, as the military historians Geoffrey Parker and Kelly de Vries explain. But the use of artillery, large enough to cause structural damage to other ships, was. Heavy guns on ships are first mentioned in the chronicle of Jean Froissart, who reports in the 1340s that some Spanish ships carried not only crossbows and handguns, but also iron cannons and culverines. Soon, reports of the use of heavy artillery multiplied. The use of guns on ships became standard. However, the heavy weight of the cannons and the forceful recoil made it quite difficult to mount them on ships. Because of this, only galleys could be equipped with heavy guns at first. This type of ship is probably better known for its use in ancient times by the Romans, but they remained important up to the early modern period. These long and flat-built, low-lying ships were propelled primarily by oars. Much like the ancient ships, most of them had a ram at the bow up to the 15th century, and were consequently well suited to carry additional weight there anyway. The ram, however, now had to make room for an artillery platform with a single gun aiming straight ahead. While at first, these were mainly iron breech loaders that fired stone shot, in the first decades of the 16th century, guns that fired iron balls or grape shot, basically shotgun rounds for artillery, were increasingly used. Around the same time, additional guns were added left and right of the main gun, so-called flanking pieces. The center guns were massive, often even on par with the heavy guns used in sieges. On ships of the Republic of Venice, for example, 120 pounders were sometimes used. These could shoot up to 900 meters and had to be mounted on gun carriages so that their recoil didn't damage their own ship. As a result, the importance of galleys for naval warfare increased enormously, and so did their numbers. In the Mediterranean, few other ships had been used for warfare since the 13th century anyway, but in northwestern Europe and in the Baltic, where the galley had been rare, it made a brilliant return. Although they never made up the bulk of war fleets there. There were several types of galleys, and the ships of European naval powers differed according to strategic objectives, availability of resources, organization and societal structure. But overall, the differences in design and construction were marginal. From the 13th century onward, mainly triremes were used in warfare. They were fast, flexible and affordable. The tactical backbone of medieval galley fleets, however, were heavy merchant galleys, as the historian John Gold Martin explains. These large ships, the battleships of the day, could carry heavy loads in peacetime and, if necessary, could be quickly converted into powerful warships by equipping them with appropriate superstructures. Genoa and Venice in particular built up their trading empires with these ships. But in the 15th century, this changed. The small fleets of four or five convertible galleys on which the Italian city-states had relied were displaced by larger fleets of smaller ships built for warfare only. By 1500, at the latest, merchant and war galleys were no longer the same ships. This gave great powers, such as the Ottoman Empire, France and Spain, a decisive advantage over Genoa and Venice. In the long run, this would become one decisive factor in the decline of the trading empires of the two city-states. Around the same time, the impressive but slow catching up of the sailing ship as a vessel for war began. Around 1500, gun ports with hatches were invented which allowed guns to be placed closer to the waterline, thus solving the balance problem. But it was still a long time before the capital sailing ship took control of the seas. Traditionally, one advantage that sailing ships had over galleys was their height. Late medieval sailing ships were usually tall and had so-called castles at the fore and aft ends. 
These were fortified superstructures that served as elevated fighting platforms and thus had a similar purpose to the walls of a fortress. For the crew of a galley, it was almost impossible to storm such a castle from their low decks. This was demonstrated impressively during the siege of Constantinople in 1453, when about 150 Turkish galleys failed to board four or five Venetian sailing ships and thus couldn't prevent them from supplying the defenders. The height of ships played an essential role, because until the 17th century, regardless of armament, the main strategy in naval warfare remained damaging and boarding the enemy ship. And in close combat, the ship with a higher position always had an advantage. However, once the low-lying galleys were equipped with guns, they could inflict serious damage on the high board of a sailing ship. The galley, meanwhile, was relatively impervious to gunfire because it offered less surface area and was thus more difficult to hit. Galleys were also able to maneuver independently of the wind. This allowed them to operate safely near the coast, which in turn made it possible for them to land troops and equipment without a harbor. Because they could be maneuvered flexibly and precisely, they were also able to fire with great accuracy, which allowed them to operate as floating siege batteries. Because of these advantages, galleys were considered indispensable for most of the 16th century, when many invasions required amphibious operations. The maneuverability of galleys was also a great advantage when fighting in formation on open water. According to Louis Sicking, the standard tactic was the line abreast. The ships lined up side by side with their pros pointed directly at the enemy formation. This was only possible because galleys could be navigated independently of the wind. In the largest naval battle of the time, the Battle of Lepanto in 1571, two fleets of over 200 galleys met. The ships of the Holy League defeated the Ottoman fleet against all odds in a costly battle. Of course, galleys equipped with heavy artillery had disadvantages too. These were largely a consequence of increasing the firepower of the ships. From 1530 onwards, two or four smaller guns often flanked the main gun. This increased the weight on the bow even further, and the galleys tended to dig their bow into the slightest head sea. To counteract this, hulls were built that were wider at the front to compensate for the weight of the artillery. This resulted in an overall increase of the weight of the ship, so that the displacement of an average war galley increased from 200 tons around 1550 to 300 tons around 1650. To maintain speed and maneuverability, more rowers were needed. Because professional rowers were expensive, the rowing system was changed. Instead of three professional rowers with one oar each, now per bench one professional rower and three slaves or prisoners rowed one large oar together. This new system was at first used in Spain around 1550. Convicts and slaves were cheaper, but they were also less efficient and didn't participate in fights. Therefore, more rowers and additional soldiers had to be on board altogether. Instead of 144 men, 180 to 200 men were now pulling on the oars, and some ships had a total crew of up to 400 men. This saved money, but the additional crew now took up a large part of the space on the ship. This reduced the galley's strategic radius of action significantly, as it needed to land more frequently to replenish water and food. Despite these efforts to keep expenses low, the cost of operating a galley ballooned. According to Geoffrey Parker, the upkeep for an average ship tripled from 1520 to 1590. In spite of these problems, the galley had built up such an advantage over sailing ships by the 16th century that European powers launched ever larger fleets and the number of war galleys increased dramatically. While Charles V could mobilize no more than 100 ships for his campaigns, his son, Philip II, regularly sent out more than 200 ships. So, galleys became larger, had bigger crews, carried more and larger cannons, and were more numerous. But fleets had a smaller range. As a result, naval operations consisted mainly of attacks on heavily fortified positions, particularly in the Mediterranean. An example is Philip II's attack on Jerba, where he and his Christian allies conquered the island and began to dig in, when they were surprised and devastated by an Ottoman fleet. Large naval battles, such as those at Previca or Lepanto, on the other hand, had become rare and usually took place near anchorages. Subsequently, in the 17th century, 
Galleys became still larger and still more powerful, but there were fewer and fewer fleets of galleys. Mixed fleets increasingly relied on sailing ships, which gradually made up for their disadvantage. By that time, galleys were no longer the main component of most fleets, but were used only for specific purposes. Nevertheless, they still had their tactical use and did not disappear altogether. Louis XIV's Mediterranean galley fleet still had 40 ships serving 12,000 rowers and 7,000 soldiers around the end of the 17th century, and Spain and the Dutch also maintained small squadrons of galleys into the 17th century. But the sailing ship was catching up in leaps and bounds. War at sea was becoming increasingly global and a fleet's range became ever more important. Soon, sailing ships surpassed galleys in firepower and range, while still being much cheaper to operate and having larger holds. The short range of rowing ships and their lack of ocean-going capability were not suited to the challenge of the open Atlantic, and thus to support the interests of the European powers in the New World. Nevertheless, the galley persisted and continued to play an important role. For example, in the Great Northern War of 1700 to 1721 in the Baltic Sea, with its small rocky islands and also in the eastern Mediterranean. But in the long run, rowing ships did not stand a chance against the new warship of the 17th century, the ship of the line. <laughs>